Okay, in this video, I'm going to go through the OCR AS level chemistry. This is uh, syllabus A. Um, this is paper one, breadth in chemistry. This is the May 2018 paper. Uh, and I'm going to do this uh, in two halves. So I'll just do the first half in this video and the second half of the paper in a later one. Okay, the okay, we've got electronic configuration of an element. Let me give you that here. What is the form of the compound form when sodium reacts with this element? Okay, so let's look at its, uh, the electronic structure. We've got 1s is filled up from the periodic table there. 2s is filled up. And we've got 2p is completely filled. Six electrons there. 3s is filled with two electrons in there. And then we have four electrons in 3p. So one, two, three, four we can see we've got it is the element sulfur, okay? Now, sodium always forms ionic compounds. So it's always gonna form Na+, which ion is sulfur gonna form? Well, it needs to get two more electrons here. It's full out of shell. So it's gonna form the S, the S2 minus ion. So what would be the formula there? Well, we're gonna have to, it's gonna to have to be two sodium ions for every one sulfide, Na2S. So the answer is C. Okay, what is the number of oxygen atoms in 88 grams of carbon dioxide? Well, whenever you want to work out the number of atoms, you need to work out the number of moles and you need Avogadro's constant. So any moles of carbon dioxide, right, that's going to be mass over MR. So that's 88 over the MR carbon dioxide is 44, two moles of CO2 molecules, okay? Uh, now one molecule of CO2 contains two oxygen atoms. So that means we've got four moles of oxygen atoms. Okay, how many moles in, how many atoms in one mole? It's 6.02 times 10 to the 23 in one mole. So four moles times that by four, and we get about 2.4 something times 10 to the 24. The answer is C. Okay. Right, now a compound has a composition by mass of that. Now we could work out the empirical formulae, but we've got to be quick when we're doing this multiple choice. So I think what we'll do is we'll just home in on the oxygen and we'll see what is the percentage of oxygen in each of those compounds. Uh, right, so in nitric acid, we've got three times 16, the, the MR of oxygen, so that's 48. Over the MR of nitric acid, that all adds up to 63 times 100, so that is going to give us, I think, um, that gives about 76%, so it's not that one. Let's do this one here, ammonium nitrate. Well, the MR of ammonium nitrate is, if you add that all that up, is 80. And we've got three options, so three times 16, that's 48 over 80 times 100, that is equal to 60%. We're sort of lucky there. The second one we've done is, um, is the right answer. We don't have to work out. Just, we'll just do, do it for that one. One more. Right, that one. Nitrous acid, that's called. So we've got two times 16 for the options. We've got 32. We've got 32. Uh, divided by the MR of this one, we've got, uh, it's 47 times 100 is going to be, that works out to be 68%, so that's too high. So yeah, the answer is B, and you can work out for the last one if you want as well. Okay. Sodium reacts with water as shown below. Which mass of sodium reacts with water to produce this many centimeters cubed of hydrogen at room temperature and pressure? Okay, so we can work out the moles of hydrogen. So the moles of any gas is equal to the volume in centimeters cubed divided by the volume of one mole, which is 24 dm cubed, so that's 24,000 centimeters cubed. 
So the moles of hydrogen gas we've got there are the volume 960 divided by 24,000. Um, that gives us 0 0.04 moles of H2. Now we need to look at the equation. We can see here that two moles of sodium give one mole of hydrogen. So therefore, our moles of sodium is going to be two times that. That's equal to 0.8. And the mass of sodium, well, that's going to be moles times by the atomic mass of sodium. That's 0 0.08. Atomic mass of sodium is 23. That gives us 1.84 grams. So the answer is C. Okay, now number five is a bit tricky. Which equation does not represent a neutralization reaction? Okay, now in a neutralization reaction, we need a base, which is a proton acceptor. reacting with an acid, which is a proton donor. Now we can see there that we have got, uh, we've got an acid in all of them. We've got hydrochloric acid, we've got sulfuric acid, we've got ethanoic acid, we've got nitric acid, so we can't eliminate that. So we need to look at these other compounds and see which ones are bases, okay? Right. Now, I'll do at least the right answer till last. Ammonia, is that a base, NH3? It is, because it ends up here as an NH4 plus ion. So that's accepted a proton. Carbonate, okay, sodium carbonate is, the, the sodium is a spectator ion. Carbonate ions, yeah, they will accept H plus ions to form CO2 and water. So that is a base, yeah forms that and here we've got the oxide ion so O2 minus which is in copper oxide that's going to accept two protons to form water uh, but this one a zinc is not a base zinc is not accepting H plus ions well, just incidentally what is zinc doing well zinc there has become a Zn2 plus ion there so zinc has actually lost electrons. It's gone from Zn to Zn2 plus. It's become oxidized. So A is the right answer. Right, this is about oxidation numbers. Right, in potassium FeO4, this compound here, which won't be familiar to you. Right, now potassium always forms, in group one, it always forms a K plus ion. So that means in this ionic substance here, the, that must have a charge of minus two, that ion, ferrate ion. Okay, so now we need to use our little equation. So the sum of the oxidation numbers is equal to the charge on the species. Right, iron, we don't know the oxidation number of that, so we'll leave it like that. Oxygen is a fixed one that's always minus two. So four times minus two gives us minus eight for the oxygen. And the charge on the species is minus two here. So add eight to both sides of the little equation there. We get Fe is equal to plus six. So C is the answer there. Uh, an unusual oxidation state of iron. It's usually plus two or plus three. Right, more on redox, and you would have to use this equation again. Some of the oxidation numbers is equal to the charge on the species here. Now it's asking us, uh, which shows the oxidation of sulfur? So what we need to do is we need to look at the oxidation number of sulfur in all those compounds and see uh, how it changes. Now, if it goes up, it's being oxidized. If it goes down, it's being reduced. And if it doesn't change, it's not a redox reaction. So in sulfuric acid, you can work it out, it's plus six. And in sulfur dioxide, it's plus four. Well, this, the, the oxidation number has gone down, so it's been reduced. Not right. Right, the oxidation number of sulfur in sulfur dioxide, we said, is plus four. Now, in sodium sulfite, you must have the SO32 minus ion there, because sodium is always plus two. Work out the oxidation number of sulfur there, it's plus four. So that reaction is not redox.
because the oxidation number doesn't change. Here, let's look at the oxidation number, sulfur plus six in sulfuric acid in H2S is actually minus two. So the sulfur has gone from plus six to minus two. It's an oxidation number has gone down, it's been reduced. Here, we've got minus two in hydrogen sulfide. Oxidation number of sulfur is zero. The element, the uncombined element has got to be zero. So it's gone up, it's gone from minus two to zero. So that has been oxidized. That's sulfur has been oxidized. D is the correct answer. Right, now this is a question which you could probably answer in year nine. What determines the order of elements of the periodic table? The number of protons in the nucleus. Okay, nine, the first five successive ionization energies of an element are shown below. Right, now let's have a look at these. We've got to look for a jump and that tells us when, we, when we're entering a new quantum shell. Now, um, right, here is a pretty big jump. It goes up tenfold here. So I think that the first electron the outer shell has is the outer shell only has one electron. Just to show you what I mean there. So from second to the third is going up by by a factor of two thirds. That one's going up by a factor of two thirds again, and that one two thirds again. So the first one is definitely the biggest jump. It goes up by a factor of ten there. So we've definitely got just one electron in the outer shell. So it's got to be a group one element. So uh, it's going to form a single positive ion. So and the chloride ion is always minus one. So the formula is going to be YCl. One plus on the positive ion, one minus on the negative. A is the right answer. Okay, which element has induced dipole dipole? So all London forces in its solid lattice. Well, boron is a tricky one. Uh, it's actually giant covalent. You wouldn't really be expected to know that, but it is. Magnesium, of course, you would be expected to know that's a, that's a metal lattice. So that's going to be the attraction between the magnesium ions and the negative elect the delocalized electrons. And that's not, that's metallic bonding, that's not uh, London forces. Silicon, that's giant covalent, very similar to diamond. Now, sulfur, you should know it exists as S8 molecules. Okay, what's, so there's no permanent dipole in those molecules, so obviously the atoms are all the same, same electronegativity. So what's holding one S8 molecule to another S8 molecule? It, the only thing it can be is these London forces, the induced dipoles. So D is the correct answer. Okay, so here, the equation for the reaction of aluminium sulfide with oxygen is shown below. Right, and we've given delta HF data, okay? And it's asking us to work out the enthalpy change of combustion, okay? Now that's confusing because you're thinking, oh, which cycle should I use? Is it the one with the combustion products or is it the one with the um, elements in the standard states? Well, you're given delta HF data, so you want the one with elements in the standard states as a third thing. Okay, now this equation here, which I've written out again in blue here, that is what we're doing with the aluminium, sorry, that's completely wrong formula, aluminium sulfide. What we're doing with the aluminium sulfide, we are reacting with oxygen. In other words, it's combustion. So is this delta HC? Well, it's not quite because we're actually we're actually burning two moles of it, the two there. So it's actually delta HC divided by uh, multiplied by two. Sorry, yeah. So we can work out this reaction here, uh, that one there, and then we can divide it by two, and that will give us delta HC. So how are we going to work out that value of that delta H? Well, we're given delta HF data. So the thing we want to do is elements in the standard states. So we want um, four aluminium solid, that's aluminium metal. We want uh, six sulfurs solid. I won't put S8, but just so you know what I mean. And then we've got 902s. So we're gonna put them there. 
Now we're given delta HF data formation. So that means we are forming those compounds from the elements down the bottom. So the arrows have got to go up. So I'm going to call that red arrow there and that green one there. Now, what are we forming on the red arrow? We are forming two moles of aluminium sulfide. Okay. So, and that is minus 723. So that's going to be two times minus 723.8. We've got nine oxygens there, O2. That's an element in its standard state, so we don't need to put anything down for that. That's going to be zero delta HF for that. So just work out the total there, and we get um, minus 1447.6. Right, let's write on the green arrow. We are forming uh, here two moles of aluminium oxide, so that's two times. Uh, minus 1675.7 and we're forming six moles of sulfur dioxide so that's six times that minus 296.8 right add that lot up together you get 5132 minus 5132.2 now we can we're in the position where we can work out this value of delta h here okay let's do that in yellow so delta H, right, we're going to go against the red arrow and then we're going to go with the green arrow. Now, because we're going against the red arrow, we have to flip that sign. So that is equal to uh, plus 1447.6. Uh, we're going with the green arrow. So this stays as a minus. So that is minus 5132. Um, and that is equal to um, minus 3684.6. Now we are forming, we, this was, so that is not delta H, it's combustion. To get delta H from this, we need to divide it by two. And that's because we've got two moles of that there. So divide that by two. And we get minus 1842.3. So the answer is B. And that's a lot of work for one mark. I think you'll agree. Okay. Right. This is an interesting question. Uh, a student carried out an experiment to measure the enthalpy change, delta H, of the combustion of methanol. Okay. Right, so they did a colorimetry experiment. They used a heated beaker of water containing water. Now the enthalpy change in combustion was more exothermic than the value in the data book, which is very unusual because of course it's always less, usually much less than the data book value because you always lose a lot of heat to the environment, okay? So let's see what could have caused the difference. Now I think what we need to do here is write down the equation. So we know that Q is equal to M that's the mass of water, specific heat capacity of water, and delta T is the temperature change. And we know that delta H is equal to the number of moles of methanol. And we also know the number of moles of methanol is going to be equal to the mass divided by the MR. Right, so that means I'm going to combine this equation. So we're going to get delta H is equal to, well, delta H, uh, sorry, just made a mistake there. Delta H is equal to Q, the value of Q we just calculated, divided by the moles of methanol. So delta H is equal to MC, delta T, divided by the moles of methanol. And then I'm going to substitute that in. So we get delta H is equal to MC delta T divided by mass over the MR of methanol. And of course, that means that MR, simplify that, is going to go on to the top line. Okay, so this should help us answer the equation. Right, so mass, okay. 
Right, what error could cause this difference? So we're getting a bigger value of delta H, more negative right, bigger more than, we, than we expect. Okay, some methanol is evaporated from the wick before the final weighing. Okay, so that means that um, uh, the, the basically the mass is going to be too big, right? If this is, the mass is, is going to be seen larger than the amount of, that's going to be too big. If the mass is too big, or we're dividing by the mass, that's going to make delta H team seem too small, which is not what we're saying. We want it, the delta H should actually be bigger due to this experiment there, so it's not that one. Right, in B, let's try B. Right, now the mistake here, the student used the molar mass of ethanol instead of methanol, that's bigger because ethanol is a bigger molecule. So this is too big. So you're multiplying it by a number that's too big. So that means that's going to make delta H too big, i.e. more negative than it should be. That is our answer. Okay. And just to confirm, incomplete combustion, well, you're going to get less heat out than you should do. That would mean the delta H was, was less negative than it should be. Uh, the water was boiling before the final, well, that what well, that would cause um, a lot of the heat to actually go into vaporizing the water instead of just raising its temperature. So that would also make delta H much uh, smaller, more less negative than it should be. So B is the answer there. Okay, more of a straightforward question, this one. Okay, we've got um, sulfur dioxide reacting with oxygen. Uh, in an equilibrium reaction. What changes in pressure would shift the equilibrium towards the products? Okay, let's think about pressure. Right, we've got fewer gas moles on the right hand side. We've only got two on the right. We've got three on the left. So we want high pressure to increase the pressure. So it's got to be C or D, uh, the products. Now it's exothermic. So that means we should lower the temperature. If we lower the temperature, Le Chatelier tells us it's going to try and raise the temperature by moving in the exo direction. We're going to get more products. So we want the, the decrease in temperature. So C is the right answer. An increase in pressure, a decrease in temperature. Uh, it's a fairly straightforward question. So we've got the reaction here. What's the correct expression for Kc? Well, that one's wrong because it's got a plus sign in it. You never have, it's always multiplied and that one's got a plus sign, so forget that. Uh, you should put the products on the top line. So it is going to be B. So it's NH3 squared divided by N2, if that is the right answer. B is right. Okay, one mole of a compound reacts with eight moles of oxygen for complete combustion. What's the formula of the compound? Well, we need to write a balanced equation for these. Okay, so let's do the first one. C4H8, and that's gonna to go to CO2 and H2O. So four carbons on the left, we need four CO2s, eight hydrogens, so that means we need four waters. How many oxygen atoms have we got on the left? We've got eight there plus in the waters, that's equal to 12. So we need 6O2. So that's only going to react with six moles. So it's, that's not the answer. Let's try B. So C4H9OH. Right, that's going to give us four carbon dioxides again. And that's going to give us five waters. How many oxygens do we need? Well, we've got. Uh, eight oxygens in the CO2 and we've got five there makes, that's equal to uh, 13, but we've already got one there. So we don't need 13, we only need 12. So again, that's gonna be 602. So that's not the answer. Let's try C. C5H11OH, that's gonna give us five CO2s and we've got, we've got 12 hydrogens there, so it's 6H2O. How many oxygens do we need for that? Well, we've got 10 in the CO2, and we've got 6 there. That's equal to 16 
So that is going to be, uh, but we've all got one there. So that's going to be 15, which is only going to be 7502. So it can't be that one. It must be the last one. Let's check it. So C5H12 goes to five carbon dioxides and six waters. Um, how many oxygens? Well, we have got um, 10 there and we've got six there. It's equal to 16. So it's going to be 802. That's eight moles of oxygen for every one mole of the stuff. So D is the right answer. This is an interesting question. How many structural isomers of C6H14 are tertiary alcohols? Right, so let's draw our essential, what do we need for tertiary alcohol? We need a carbon with an OH on it, and that's got to be attached to four other carbons. But by the way, if you look at the ratio there, you can tell that is completely saturated. There's no double bonds in that because it's C6H14, it's CnH2n plus two, so we don't have to worry about double bonds. Now, we need this basic unit here, don't we? And we've got four carbons in there, but we've got six. We need to add carbons, okay? So what we could do is, I'm gonna just copy that, I think. One minute. So we know we've got to have that structure. Draw another one. And another one. Okay, we've got two more carbons to add on to that. Right, what we could do is we could add a carbon onto each of those. One there, one there, and of course all the hydrogens to go with it. Right, that's one. Now, would it be different if we did carbon there? Of course, it wouldn't. It's exactly the same thing. We've just sort of drawn it around a corner. So that's there's only one possibility. We have a carbon attached to each of those. So that's one isomer. Also, we could put two onto just one carbon. And of course, that would be the same if we added it there or there as well. So that's another one. Now, are there any more? Well, there are. What we could we could have a little branch. So we could put a carbon there and a carbon there. Okay fill in the hydrogens. So the answer to this one is there are three possibilities. Uh, if you if you add all the hydrogens onto those carbons, you'll find that they does add up to the right number. It will add up to 14 carbons. Okay. But three is the answer. There's three possibilities there. Okay. Naphthalene. Okay. Right. We've got to work out the molecular formula of naphthalene. So first of all, Let's work out the number of carbon atoms. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Okay, so it can't be those two. How many hydrogens have we got? Well, each carbon has got to form four bonds. All right, so let's think this one is going to have one. That's going to have one. That's going to have one. This one's got none. That one's got one, one there, one there, one there, none there, and one there. So that gives us how many is it? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So the answer is A. There's another way of doing that if you want to double check, if you just a quick, nice, easy way. Right, what you do is you start off with the number of carbons. You've got CnH2n plus 2. Now that's a bit saturated. Now every time you have a double bond, or a ring, a cyclic thing, you subtract two H's. Okay, so right, so we've got uh, 10 carbons there, so it would be CnH. Uh, 22 but how many double bonds have we got we've got one two three four five and how many rings have we got we've got two so that's seven so seven lots of two minus 14 gives us eight which is
which is the what, what you got there. So that's another way of, of doing it a quicker way. Uh, it's fairly useful. Okay, <clears throat> number 18, a student reacts pent in with bromine in the lab. Okay, what's the compound? So I would draw this out. You wouldn't try and do it in your head because you're likely to make mistakes. Um, or I am anyway. Right, five carbons for pent. Okay, it's pent in. One, two, three, four, five. We've got our double bond there. Now, what happens when you add Br onto an alkene? You add a, you break the double bond. That goes. And you add a bromine onto each of the carbon in the double bond. Okay, what's that called? It's called 2,3-dibromopentane. Okay, so that's it there. D. Right, EZ isomers here, okay. The two double bonds, and we've got to say which one's E and which one's Z. So don't forget to, Z is the high priorities together, and E is the high priorities opposite. And the high priority groups are basically the heaviest, the biggest molecular weight, yeah? Right, let's look at um, number one, carbon number one. Right, which groups has it got? I'm going to put a hydrogen on there. It's got a hydrogen and a methyl attached to that carbon. So where's the high priority one is going to be the methyl. On this carbon here, we have got a methyl. That's a methyl. And we've got this much bigger group here. So obviously that's the high priority one. So the high priority, I'll draw that in blue, that's the high priority. So that you can see that they're on opposite sides of the molecule, so they are E. So we can get rid of that one and that one. Now we need to think about the, the second double bond. The second double bond, number two. Right, we have got a hydrogen on there and then we've got this big group here which is obviously much heavier and that's the high priority uh, on the other carbon we've got a hydrogen there and we've got a methyl and methyl is the highest priority and once again they're on the opposite side so they are e so the right answer is c okay Right, which fragment, which alcohol is likely to have a fragment of MZ31 in its mass spectrum? Right, okay. So, uh, the ethyl group, that weighs 29. The methyl group weighs 15. That's going to help us a bit. Okay, so look. What we got on this side here, we have got, right, that, that bit's going to be 29. So when you add on the, another carbon, that's going to be way too big. That's too big, that fragment there. Let's look at this fragment. Right, we've got there 15 for the methyl, for the CH3. And then we've got 16 for the oxygen plus one for the hydrogen. That's 17. That makes 32, so that's no good. It's too big, okay? Not that one. B is not looking very promising. Uh, this is a propyl group. That's 43, that's way too big, okay? Um, so that's not, not, that's no good. This one, the C, isn't looking very promising. You've got another propyl group there, and you've got right, this. This bit's going to be too big as well. Right, this looks quite promising to me. What have we got here? We've got CH two, which is fourteen, and oxygen plus hydrogen. That makes sixteen plus one makes seventeen. That would give you 
31. So that is going to be the answer. D is the answer. Uh, you could get this fragment here. That break off there, CH2OH, positive ion. That will give you an MZ of 31. Okay, and that, that sort of question makes it more difficult. They're drawing it out in a single line rather than the displayed formula because you can't sort of draw circles around it and see the easy, the easy way of doing it. <coughs> okay, this is a fairly straightforward question about silicon. It's in the P block, it right, exists as three isotopes. Complete the tables to show the atomic structure of silicon 30. Right, now you need to look up in the periodic table. You'll see that silicon has got a mass number of 14 okay uh, and so that means it's going to have 14 protons uh, number of neutrons is going to be 30 minus 14 which is 16 um, and the, the the neutral atom will have the same number of electrons as protons that's 14 electrons okay now this bit i give you mass spectrum and the relative abundances. Now it's probably easiest to convert these into fractions rather than percentages. So let's, that would be 0 0.9223. Uh, that one would be 0 0.0468 and 0 0.0309, divide by them by 100. Now if we do that, the AR is equal to the abundance multiplied by the mass of the isotope. It's going to be so 28 multiplied by 0.9223 plus 29 times 0 0.0468 plus 30 times 0 0.0309. Okay, work that out and you get Twenty-eight point one zero eight six, and it says give it two decimal places, so we need to round that up. So you round that up, that gives twenty-eight point one one is the answer there. Twenty-eight point one one. Okay. Right. Phosgene. Okay, so they've got phosgene. Exist as simple molecules and the displayed formula, sorry, is given below. We need to draw a dot cross diagram of that. Okay, so what we want is let's draw we've got carbon here and oxygen. And we've got two chlorines, okay. Right. Carbon is in group four. I'll draw the electrons of carbon as dots. Oxygen is in group six. I'll draw them as red dots. And chlorine is in group seven. I draw them as blue dots. And uh, obviously, so carbon's got four of its own electrons. Um, oxygen has got six electrons in the outer shell. And, and chlorine have got seven. Right, this one's a double bond, so I need to put in four electrons. Right, let's finish it off for oxygen. I've drawn two red dots. We need six, so I need to draw two lone pairs. Uh, for, now, in the single bond between the chlorine there, so just one pair of electrons, the blue electron from the chlorine. Now, Carbon is in group four. How many green dots have I drawn? I've drawn four, so I've drawn them all. Don't need to add any lone pairs outside. They're all involved in bonding. Chlorine, right, that's in group seven. I've only drawn one, so I need to draw six more. So that's three lone pairs for each one, like that. Um, each element there, each atom has got a four, eight electrons in its outer shell. Okay, so that's our diagram. Right, now, 
Name the shape of the phosgene molecule and explain why it has this shape. Okay, right, what has it got? What would we do? When we have a double bond, we just treat that when the shape's a molecule as though it is a single bond, okay? Um, because it's made up of a pi bond and a sigma bond. Right, so the name, so we have got, I'll do the explanation bit first, we have got three pairs of electrons or three bonding pairs. And we've got no lone pairs around the carbon. What do they try and do? They try and repel each other. The pairs repel each other. Sorry. As much as possible. And the way they can do that is by having a, a bond angle of 120 degrees between them and like this. And all of those uh, chlorines or oxygens and chlorines, they're all in the same plane as is the phosphorus. So it is called trigonal planar. Right. Why are silicon, oxygen and chlorine classified as p-block elements? Well, it's because the last uh, electron shell to be filled or the highest energy electron shell is um, is the is the p subshell. In the case of carbon, it's two p. In case of oxygen, two p. In the case of chlorine, it's three p. You don't need to say that though for the one mark. Right. Reaction between magnesium and phosphorus. Phosphorus, okay. Um, it prepares, prepares magnesium phosphate by using the redox reaction of magnesium with phosphoric acid. There's a the reaction. In terms of number of electrons transferred, explain whether magnesium is being oxidized or reduced. Well, let's have a look. Magnesium here is the metal. It's got a full outer shell. Of, sorry, it's, got, uh, it's not missing any electrons, no charge. Now, magnesium, when it forms compounds, it's in group two, it always forms the Mg2 plus iron, okay? Now you may not be familiar with the phosphate iron, but that's got a three minus charge on it. And that's why the formula is this, okay? So what's happened to the magnesium? All well, you need to know is magnesium always forms a two plus iron in its compounds. What's happened to turn it from a magnesium atom to an Mg2, it has lost two electrons. Losing two electrons, we're losing any electrons is oxidation. Oil rig oxidation is loss. So the magnesium is being oxidized. And incidentally, it's the hydrogen that's being reduced because the hydrogen is gaining the electrons from the magnesium. It doesn't ask you that, yeah. Okay, three marks this question. The student plans to add magnesium to 50 centimeters cubed of phosphoric acid. Calculate the mass of magnesium the student should add to react exactly, okay? Right, so what we're going to have to do here is we can work out the moles of phosphoric acid. So moles of H3PO4 is equal to the concentration times by the volume. The concentration is 1.24. The volume in dm cubed is 50 over 1,000. Work that out. We get the number of moles of phosphoric acid to be... Uh, that works out to be 0 0.062 moles. Now, this equation shows us that three moles of magnesium react with two moles of phosphoric acid. So how many moles of magnesium can that much phosphoric acid react with? Well, it's going to be three over two, isn't it? Times that. So moles mg is equal to 0 0.062 multiplied by three, divide by two. That gives us 0 0.093 moles of magnesium. And the question is asking is the, the mass. Okay, so the mass is equal to the mass of Mg is equal to the moles multiplied by the MR or the AR, atomic mass of magnesium, 0 0.093 multiplied by 
A of magnesium is 24.3, which gives us um, 2.599 grams. Right, but we've got to give our answer to three significant figures, so we should call that 2.60 grams is our final answer. Okay, how could the student obtain a sample of magnesium phosphate after reacting magnesium with the phosphoric acid? Well, you need to look at the equation there to realize look, it is a solid. It's not a soluble salt, it is an insoluble salt. Magnesium phosphate, phosphate solid. So how do you get rid of that? Well, you should uh, filter it. Filter off the solid. And really you should then, because it can have a bit of, it might have a bit of phosphoric acid still in there, wash the solid, wash the filtrate with a bit of distilled water. Okay. Okay, phosphine, question three, how is this question? Is that question two? Yeah, okay, question three. Um, phosphine is a gas formed by heating phosphor phosphorus acid, this slightly different form of H3PO3, in the absence of air. Right, 3.2 times 10 to the minus 2 moles of H3PO4 is completely decomposed by the reaction. Calculate the volume of phosphorus, phosphine gas formed. Uh, at this pressure and 200 degrees C. We're going to need to use the ideal gas equation here. Let's do the first bit. So let's work out the moles of um, phosphorus acid, moles of H3PO3. So they tell us that it's 0 0.3.20 times 10 to the minus two. Uh, the equation shows us that four moles of this gives us one mole of phosphine. So we're going to say, therefore, the moles of phosphine, we've got to divide that number by 4. 3.2 times 10 to the minus 2 divided by 4. That's equal to 8.0 times 10 to the minus 3 moles. Now we need to put this into our ideal gas equation. Let's write down the ideal gas equation. PV is equal to NRT. We need to just work out the volume. And that's going to give NRT over P. Now we need to be really careful here with the units because in the ideal gas equation, the volume is in meters cubed. Okay, so we're going to have to convert that to centimeters cubed afterwards. The pressure should be in pascals, not in kilopascals. So that's going to be 100 kilopascals. That's going to be 100 times 10 to the 3 pascals. And the temperature should be in Kelvins, 200 degrees C. So we've got to add 273 to give us in Kelvin. That's going to be 473 Kelvin. Right, let's put our numbers into that equation. We get V is equal to number of moles, 8.0 times 10 to the minus 3, multiplied by 8.31, the gas constant in your data booklet, times by T, the temperature, 473 Kelvin divided by the pressure in Pascal's 100 times 10 to the 3. That gives us our answer in V in meters cubed, and that is uh, 3.14 4 times 10 to the minus 4 meters cubed. Now, this is where people forget that 1 meter cubed, how many is actually a million centimeters cubed? So we need to multiply this number by a million to get the answer in centimeters cubed. So times that by a million. So V in centimeters cubed is equal to 314.4 centimeters cubed. And we should really give that to three significant figures because all our data is given to three significant figures. So we should call that 314 centimeters cubed. Okay. 
Right. When for exposed to air, phosphine spontaneously ignites forming P4O10 and water, right an equation for the reaction. So we've got pH3 uh, plus oxygen. And it's going to give us uh, phosphorus 5 oxide, P4O10 and H2O. Right. So we've got four phosphoruses there. So we're going to have to put a four there. That means we have got 12 hydrogens. So that means we're going to need six H2Os. That means we have now got 10 oxygens plus six oxygens. That's 16. So we need eight H2O. And that is as far as I'm going to go with, with this particular paper. And I'll cover the next half of it in the next video. Uh, one question I just I realized is missing and it said, um, it's a short one mark question. It said, uh, what else could you react phosphoric acid with uh, other than magnesium to give magnesium phosphate? Right. Uh, now, the answer I would give for that is the best way of making it. Well, you could add any base. You could add, you could add some magnesium oxide, which is a solid. You could do that. Magnesium carbonate, which is a solid, that would work. And that's going to react with phosphoric acid. They'll, they'll both give you that. But because this is an insoluble solid, I think the best way to make it is by precipitation. So it would add a soluble magnesium compound. So it would add magnesium chloride, which is pretty soluble. And react that with phosphoric acid. Uh, and you would get magnesium phosphate. Um, and I have to balance that by putting a, uh, a three there and a two there. And you would also make um, six HCLs there as well. That would be, and there'd be an aqueous solution and that would be a solid. So that was the method I would choose. I think it was a one mark question just for that. OK, so that is the end of that paper. And I'll do the next half in another video.